What's up, YouTube? This is Kyle, and I'm back with another video. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and act like I've been consistent over the last few weeks with videos because I haven't. And the reason for that, in short, is because I'm dealing with a little bit of an injury, nothing serious, but I just want to make sure I'm fully healed up before I jump back on the mats. And while I was kind of in that period, this coronavirus thing hit. So obviously that doesn't help the situation any. So it's not going to be too much of footage of me like rolling and doing open mats and things like that. But I was able to get this interview with a neurologist. And so I wanted to share that with y'all, um, especially the fact that, like I said, I don't have any new footage of me rolling to put up. So over the next few weeks, I'll be trying to, trying to do uh, interviews and just kind of some talking points on things that y'all might want to hear about so in the meantime i hope y'all like it don't forget to like subscribe and leave any comments thank you for watching hey so first um for our viewers i just wanted you to kind of just introduce yourself kind of let us know a little bit about your background and then we'll kind of tie this into the jujitsu thing Good. uh hello everyone i am Marcus Semino. I am a neurology resident, uh, finishing up my training. I went to medical school at NYU, and I'm doing my training at Harvard UCLA Medical Center uh, over here in California. And I am going to subspecialize into neuromuscular medicine, and I'll be going to the University of Pennsylvania for that. Perfect, perfect. So right now, currently, you are on the West Coast. I am on the West Coast. It is 9 a.m., for me. Thank you for being up early. Oh awesome. yeah. No, thanks for accommodating me. I was kind of sick yesterday. So, so I, we were kind of going back and forth on Instagram on the DMs. And I think you mentioned that either you were from Torrance or used to live in Torrance. Is that? No, uh, I am working in Torrance. Oh, okay. You're currently. Uh, and right down the street is a, one of the Gracie Jiu Jitsu schools. Yeah. And I, uh, I used to do Jiu Jitsu when I was much younger. Mm -hmm. Um, but I kind of, I kind of grew out of it, I guess. Okay. But I was, it was always a great experience doing that training, and uh, really, actually helped me like be more confident, build my self esteem, and it was a great way to exercise too. So absolutely, yeah, I thought that was a like a perfect. I was looking for you know some people to interview for this topic, and um, I found that you were like right in Torrance, and come to find out you trained a little bit, so it's not yeah. too foreign for you when I start you know bringing into the uh, in the jujitsu world. Um, so if you see me kind of looking away, I, I have some notes over here that just, I want to make Same. sure I'm covering everything. So, Same here. <laughs> all right. So, um, the first thing I wanted to ask you about is kind of the differences between, um, like long-term and short-term damage, if there are any with chokes, um, as you know, like in the professional UFC, even in jujitsu tournaments, once you, you know, quote unquote tap, you're supposed to stop. That's, sure. that's the game. Um, but what about situations, you know, maybe real life or um, maybe a UFC or, you know, the referee doesn't stop it fast enough? Are there like certain points like after, you know, 10 seconds, there's this amount of damage and on to, you know, 30 seconds is more permanent damage? Could you kind of talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so the answer uh, is it depends. Um, there is actually a lot of research or not a lot of research. That's the problem. There's some. Uh, controversial research where, uh, and I'll send you the links later if you're, if you're interested, uh, sure. but some people were suggesting that maybe even the, just doing the chokes in practice over time, and even if it's only for a few seconds, accumulates over time and causes uh, subtle changes in the uh, brain architecture and uh, damage to one's cognition. Mm -hmm. But that that is not... So, that research is not solidified. It's still up in the air. Um, one of one of the papers that counters that uh, says that really a choke, uh, like just for a few seconds, like ten seconds, right. is really more like fainting than it is like um, something more serious, like a stroke. Um. So what I mean by that is when you do a choke, most chokes are stopping. They're actually, most chokes don't block the airway per se. They actually are stopping the blood flow of the jugular veins and the carotid arteries. Right. So that results in less blood with oxygen, specifically mm -hmm. oxygenated blood, meaning blood that's carrying oxygen, going to the brain. Okay. And it also prevents blood that's uh, low on oxygen from leaving the brain. 
Oh, okay. So what happens is the brain now is in an environment with less oxygen and it needs that to function. Okay. Uh, if you or I, someone young who, I don't know if you ever stood up too fast and got a little dizzy or lightheaded when you stood up. Right. Yeah. Sometimes people will do that and they'll actually faint or pass out, especially if just from standing pain. up too fast. Sometimes. Yeah. It's called orthostatic hypotension, very common. And uh, it doesn't necessarily mean anything is wrong with you, but that idea is blood oxygenated blood is not reaching the brain. Mm -hmm. And for just a few seconds, your higher cortical functions, i.e. your consciousness, your vision, it gets shut down because your brain needs to preserve as much of the oxygenated blood for the for core functions like your heartbeat, uh, your homeostasis of, of your temperature and your breathing. Okay. And uh, in order to preserve those things, it will kind of shut down the higher cortical functioning. And that's what happens when you pass out from a 10 second hold or right. getting up too fast. Uh, which is usually not a bad thing. Um, when it's bad is when it goes on for too long. Right. So uh, if the choke goes on for, you know, 30 seconds or more, um, the your neurons, your brain cells need a lot of oxygen and they right. need a lot of sugar. Um, they're very greedy in that sense. You're more greedy than your heart or your liver per se. Okay. But because of that, some, and this will vary on per, from person to person, uh, some of those brain cells will die. Now, thankfully, we have billions and billions of brain cells, but uh, in the world of stroke and people who have stroke, there's a term called time is brain, meaning the less, the longer you uh, are missing oxygenated blood from your brain, the more likely you are going to lose brain tissue. Oh, okay. being like going to die out because it's not getting the nutrients it needs. Okay. So yes, a, a, someone holding you for a minute or, you know, four minutes, right. um, and maybe even 30 seconds can cause, uh, some brain damage. Now, 30 seconds would in most cases be minimal and maybe not even noticeable brain damage. 30 so, seconds. That just sounds like a long 30 seconds. That's. Because I mean, you know, we we both trained before. Sure. I'd say after, I mean, if the tight if the choke is tight, you know, you have you obviously have to cut off both sides. Mm -hmm. Just one, you're you're okay. But both sides, after about five or six seconds, it's like I'm I'm ready to go out. Like you start getting the the blurred vision around the edges and things mm -hmm. start to kind of close in. I can only imagine thirty. Like you're out after the first ten, right. sure, but up to thirty, it's like oh man, that's definitely. It would seem like it's some serious. It would seem like I I, I don't know for sure, but it would and, seem it, and it could it would be it could be um, you know and actually you kind of bring up an interesting point. Um, most times you are right. It would be okay if you're only blocking one side, mm -hmm. but my blood vessels are probably not the same as your blood vessels. And what I mean by that is. When we, when we're born our, and our blood vessels are developing in the embryo and, right. uh, they then form in our brain forms, the pathway of those blood vessels might be a little different between you and me. Like if you were to look at the, you know, if you're working out at the gym and your, your veins are kind of pumped up right. and you looked at the guy next to you, who's also lifting weights or the girl on the other side lifting weights, you realize the veins going down your arm aren't in the same exact position for each person. True. That's the same case when it goes into the brain. So and there's even some uh, rare situations where uh, there's something called the fetal origin of blood vessels, meaning that the blood vessels going up to the back of the brain are supplying more area than they should be. Or vice versa, you could have one carotid artery that's not really doing too much in terms of supplying blood flow to the brain and your body's really relying on the other side. Oh, so that could be a, a case where you might have a, 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 a less effective, I guess you are less efficient vein on one side and the other one is carrying, you know, whatever percentage more. Exactly. 
Oh, that's, yeah. that's that's different. That's, I've never I never even thought of it. I just assumed that everybody had the oh, same symmetric. Yeah, yeah, it's not. So that's not the case. Yeah. Um. So another point I wanted to kind of ask about. You mentioned earlier. You said that there's a different. You said most chokes, um, don't necessarily cut off the airway. So mm -hmm. is is there a difference between, okay, so not getting enough oxygen from the veins through blood. That's one thing. Now what about the, I, I don't know what organ or the trachea or whatever this yep, is, yeah, yep. like kind of smashing that in. So it's like, I can't like, literally, I can't breathe. Is that the same as like suffocation or like what's the? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Um, it is, but the difference is, uh, the, so the way we get blood, the way we get oxygen into our blood, we take a deep breath in, fill up our lungs and all the blood that's flowing from either our arms or our legs or our brain. And it's all the oxygens, or mostly oxygen's taken out of it because it went to help our muscles and our organs. Right. That blood is returning back to our lungs. And as it flows through the lungs, and we take a deep breath in, uh, the oxygen permeates kind of like, um, I can't think of a good example, but if you could picture just like, uh, if someone put uh, like an Alka-Seltzer tab in a glass of water and you see the bubbles rise up right it's the the pressure of the oxygen in your lungs kind of it pushes itself into the blood mm -hmm. and then into the blood cells and then the blood the uh, hemoglobin which is the protein that holds the oxygen will snatch it up okay. and then that oxygenated blood goes back to the heart and that's when you pump up to the brain or your arms or wherever now, the reason I mention this is because there's a couple steps before that, before it reaches your brain. Mm -hmm. And so if you're blocking the airway, um, one, it takes more force to block the airway because you have, it's like a hard cartilage right. structure. Um, there's some, some muscles around it, depending on how high you are. There might be more neck muscles or the even the chest in the way if you're not in a good position. Right. But um, if you cut off the oxygen there, your body still has that blood will have to go first to the brain lose the oxygen come back down to the heart then get pumped to the lungs and then will leave the lungs and go back to the heart without oxygen so there's a couple steps before it goes and reaches the brain which is so, why an airway chokehold uh will take longer to knock someone out Right. That's what I was, that's what I was going to get to. So yeah. that would make, cause the, the, the entire pro like the blood chokes are like kind of right to the point. Like you need the blood immediately versus mm -hmm. the air. It's like you, the whole process you just explained. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. That makes yeah. sense. So it takes a lot longer. I don't think me personally, I've ever, is that, do you get the same feeling of lightheaded? Cause from what I remember, I think it's just like, like you can't breathe. Like you just yeah. like, you, know, you just, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good word. Yeah, man, he's like, um, I, I need to inhale. I need to exhale. Yeah, so yeah. that's kind of a different feeling. Um, uh, in fact, if you just read, like, if you just touch right here, uh, it's called the jugular notch, although don't confuse it with the jugular veins. Mm -hmm. If you read, point right here, there's a little notch right above your sternum. Right. If you press in, if you press in on someone, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And that feeling of discomfort, your body knows, like, no, that's not, that pressure shouldn't be there. Right. And in a way, it does take longer to knock someone out, but people are going to feel more uncomfortable in that hold as well. So, yeah, um, it's I wouldn't choose either if I had, yeah. but if I well, but if I had to choose, I guess a, a, a stopping the blood flow to my brain would be preferable because it's less uh, uncomfortable. It's it's less discomfort. It doesn't hurt as much. And that's um, that's something that people I see like in in matches certain choke holes you kind of don't even notice that you're being choked mm. until it's like too late because it's like it's so slow sometimes some probably sometimes the person doesn't even have to like necessarily squeeze they can just lean like and, and you, you just feel like it's you know normal pressure and then all of a sudden like I said you get the blurry vision and then mm -hmm. sometimes you you just may not be able to, to have the energy to lift the hand to tap so and then it's like you're you're already unconscious luckily for me personally i haven't been like 100 percent. i've gotten close like i said i've seen the, the, the blurriness on the yeah. edges but but i haven't gotten going all the way out yet so that's that's definitely a good thing um but it's 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 weird how the brain works and that kind of 
um, leads me to the, my next question or like topic mm-hmm. of, um, you know, there's a lot of things out here about CTE and um, uh, what is what does that stand for? Cere- I'm not even going to guess. A chronic that. traumatic encephalopathy. Okay, I would not have guessed and, that. But. Encephalopathy means disease of the brain of the um, of the head. Yeah. Okay. And um, could you talk to us a little bit about, like I said, that's kind of a big topic. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit about that because I know, like in most jujitsu only tournaments. There's no slamming. I don't know if it's necessarily because of that, but being slammed on on your back is never good. But could you kind of talk to us a little bit about that in the CTE? Sure. CTE, C-T-E yeah. C-T-E. Um, so uh, CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, I'll say that five times fast, um, is basically uh, the chronic being repeated over time. Uh, so if you have repeated injuries to the head over time uh the idea behind this is that your brain gets little bruises but it doesn't bruise like your arm and heal itself um those breakdown products will kind of accumulate and this is a very hot topic and i think they're still trying to figure out the exact mechanism but the the basic idea behind it is that you cause subtle little brain damage with each little hit to the head usually in boxing or football or even even soccer, if you're doing too many headbutts or getting knocked to the ground too many times. Right. Um, and these the breakdown products from your brain and the resulting loss in brain tissue because they were injured, um, over time may cause memory issues, personality changes. Um, sometimes people have uh, vision issues. If you ever hear anyone like seeing double, uh, like after getting knocked I thought, yeah. down pretty hard, um, it's over time these accumulate into then what's what start to appear like other things like dementia or personality changes, um, like the, you know, for, uh, for example, I think uh, there's been some prominent football players who, or even wrestlers who, maybe resulted in like committing crimes after or allegedly committing crimes after the fact of and when they when they've died they've looked at their brain and their brain looks like an 80 year old in mm. the sense that it's very it's shrunk it looks like it's had little injuries over a course of their lifetime mm-hmm. um so that's what chronic traumatic encephalopathy is in a nutshell okay. um, it's repeated trauma to the brain from a trauma, although it may not be a severe trauma, not like a car accident, but maybe one or two many, one too many punches to the head, or even one punch to the head could cause a little bit of damage. But the mm-hmm. chronic portion of that word, of that phrase, meaning repeated over time. Okay. So, it's, I mean, I'm not obviously, you know, in the medical field, but it seems like this is like a, a, a not a new topic, but I'd say... 10, 15 years ago, when a football player retired, they just retired and that was kind of it. Why do you think it's, and this is just kind of, I guess, an, an opinion question. Like, why is it like a, a thing now? Like, what's what's the issue now? Well, um, um, oh man, I, the name is, eludes me at the moment. A football player? A, uh, no, the, there's this, uh, this researcher, this uh, oh. physician, uh, he, he had a lot of research and he started looking at the brains of football players. There, there, there was a movie called Concussion. Um, Didn't I, I, I've heard of it. I've heard of it. Was it starring Will Smith? I forget. Yeah, I think it was starring Will Smith. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're, yeah. yeah. And he was a foot, uh, he, he was, he worked for the NFL or yeah. team or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I and he, started, name, so. he started looking at these football players with all the repetitive head injuries. Mm-hmm. And I think that was in the maybe 90s or early 2000s, and then they made a movie about it more recently. Um, but I think we hear about these things, and then as a whole, the medical field tends to move a little bit slow because they want to make sure the research is done in a proper, systematic fashion. So I, th- I think part of the reason is we're only hearing, it, hearing about it now is just because uh, researchers and uh, the funding behind said research needed time to develop okay. um i think there's also been some big high 
big cases of uh, football players who have committed crimes. And I think there's been like at least one or two instances where a football player felt like there was something wrong wrong with them neurologically and actually um, you know, killed themselves by shooting themselves in the heart so that their brain could be used for research. Um, those types of things I think have really caught the eye of media and re and uh, and the medical field and trying to figure out why is this happening? Why is the suicide rate so high in people with traumatic head injuries? Not just football players, but right. soldiers that have had that were in active uh, active combat zones that maybe were near explosions and had traumatic uh, brain injuries as a result. Oh. Oh, even so, it's not even necessarily a contact to the head, like you just mentioned, like explosions. That still mm -hmm. is tied to, yeah, uh, just a blast. You know, a concussive blast can do the same thing. Basically, um, if you think about it, if your head moves fast, your your brain and your is kind of hold sitting in your skull like a like a ball on a stick. Right. The stick being the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. So if you hit the skull really fast, the brain is going to, it's going to hit the brain before the brain starts moving with it. Right. Uh, and then the brain might rattle around a little bit. Same thing if uh, you're getting punched in front of your face like this and punch this way, the skull will actually hit the brain first right. before the brain moves with the head. You ever see those slow motion videos of someone getting punched in the face? It's kind of like, you see their face move before their head moves. It's kind of right. uh, this jolting sensation. Wow. So it's that impact that the brain feels within the skull that causes those little, uh, that damage. So it can be an explosion. Uh, it can be getting knocked to the ground, falling, and and maybe not even hard, but hitting your head too many times oh, or right. direct contact from a punch or a kick. Okay. I didn't know that yet because I just assumed, which I, I guess most other people would, that it had to be an actual, you know, like physical contact to the head. But like you said, like an, even an explosion can do that, that like you just demonstrated with the uh, brain inside the head. That's yeah. where I, I, I never knew that. But um, so I wanted to kind of go back a little bit. Uh, you mentioned, we, we talk, kind of talked about the blood chokes and the air chokes. Mm -hmm. And while you were talking about that, I thought, is there a difference? Like, you know, if your heart is up because you're training, you know, you're in the third round of five minutes a piece, you're kind of, you know, your heart is pounding, uh, your heart rate is really fast. Is there, um, does that factor into how fast you would necessarily pass out if you're choked versus, you know, if I've been running around for 15 minutes and my heart rate is up and I get choked, versus somebody who's, you know, just got out of bed and, you know, they're choking, their, their heart rate is like a lot lower. Does, would that make a difference on how fast mm. they would, would pass out? Well, good question. Um, I don't know if I have the exact answer for that, but I can tell you two things. One, where um, the idea of the passing out is just, if you, if you move, the, if you separate the mechanism of how the person's passing out, just, and look, focus on the idea of, less blood flow to the brain. Someone who has a, a low heart rate, you know, at rest, they just, they're woke up, they're in bed, the heart rate's maybe 60 beats a minute, pretty slow. And then they stand up real fast because they have to use the bathroom. Right. And that person passes out, their heart rate's low and then drops even further because their blood isn't getting pumped up to their brain. And then they may pass out. Whereas um, for someone who is, uh, doing a sparring in a jiu-jitsu match they're not they're passing out because of the pressure uh to the vessel and it's unrelated to the heart rate God. with that said you know if someone's heart rate's moving very fast you can actually uh sometimes cause someone to pass out because there's there's actually some nerve bodies and bundles that ride along the carotid artery mm -hmm. and when your heart rate's going too fast and you, it slows down suddenly, uh, you can pass out that way. Um, just because your body just realizes it's getting way too active and your heart rate slows down and then that way you pass out. Okay. All right. So, so it's not, really, not exactly not it. Not so much related to the heart rate per se, but um, 
I, I haven't seen any research saying, saying otherwise. So it'd be interesting to see if anyone actually uh, looks into that. All right, let me just take, I'm gonna make sure I touch on everything um, that I had. So you mentioned in our um, DMs about, I'm gonna try to, is it hypoxia? Yep. Hypoxia and neuro, neuro. Praxia. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I think you might may have mentioned the two during this conversation, but um, are those like con like conditions so hypoxia is just a term of low oxygen. Okay. So when you're getting it choked out, that is you are entering into a state of hypoxia. Okay, because that's just a lack. Okay. Lack of lack of oxygen. Yeah, just some fancy Latin terms. Okay. okay. Um, a neuropraxia is actually related to a peripheral injuries of the peripheral nerves. Okay. So like your your arm nerves or your legs. Um, it's usually regarding a tra either traumatic injury or a stretching injury uh, to the nerve causing damage. So it, it can can that be a, a result of a choke or is that like a like an arm lock situation or I think it's more like an, an arm lock situation where you're if you're pulling someone's arm out like this and pulling it hard right. or if you did like a, a really uh, rough throw and it kind of pulled their arm a little bit as you threw them over your hip. Uh, it could cause, theoretically, it could cause uh, some nerve injury. Is that like a, a permanent type of thing? Or is that like, because I've had situations, again, me personally, where like you get like a tingle, like a tingly feeling, but it, it kind of goes away. It's like, if you land, like you said, if you land too hard on your shoulder, sure. you're, you know, you kind of, you just kind of just shake it out and it's mm -hmm. like, you know, you figure it out. But um, is that kind of maybe something in that realm? Yeah, yeah, that it very well could be. Um, and it's a lot, neuropraxia is by definition not serious. It usually gets better over time. It may take up to weeks to get better. You might have some pain or tingling, uh, maybe even some weakness, depending on what nerve was affected, um, but usually gets better over time. Um, if a couple of weeks goes by and it's not completely better, you know, it's worth seeing a physician for and getting a nerve conduction study or a test to just look at the nerve activity and the muscle activity, because then if it's if it's a more serious injury, then there's something called and I have trouble pronouncing this one, axo, axonomesis, uh, axonomesis, uh, which is just a more uh, severe version of neuropraxia. Okay, all right, that's um like I said because you had mentioned that word and I wanted to make sure that I was. Want to at least touch on it, but um, I, I think I get the the gist of what you're saying. But I think I covered um everything that I wanted to get into. Um, it's just a real interesting topic uh, for me to kind of get your a person like your you know perspective on what happens, what exactly happens, because you always hear, oh, this is a blood choke, this is a a, a, a air choke, and you can kind of kind of guess at what it is, but to basically understand, it's the flow of oxygen either to and well to and from the brain is mm -hmm. not is insufficient for that amount of time five ten seconds or whatever it is yeah. and the longer you go um the more likely that you're going to have serious long-term kind of damage yeah. at that point yeah um, i would say you know if you can limit the amount of times you get knocked out obviously it seems common yeah. sense but uh maybe just even in practice you know not doing the not doing a, the choke at 100% effort, just kind of making sure your technique's right, making sure the pressure feels right just for a second before uh, you you know see the your vision go blurry and before you yeah. pass out because it's unnecessary. You know, obviously, if you need to do it in a you know a, a match or even a real life situation like a fight, uh, you know you got to do what you have to do. But um, yeah, I, I would say to be on the safe side until the research pans out, minimizing. Uh, the times you pass out is probably sure. Yeah. Uh, ideal. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just I'm just curious. How long did you train for when you? Oh, um, so the school I trained at was a kind of a mixed. Uh, I guess you could say it's mixed martial arts, but not in the same way as like octagon sort of uh, right, like... fighting. But we it was a school that we did uh, Muay Thai, um, Jiu Jitsu, and a little bit of taekwondo and they oh. kind of mixed the styles together okay. and then some days we focused on 
more uh, Muay Thai and other days we focus more on Jiu Jitsu. Okay. Um, so, so about like, I would say answer your question about maybe, um, maybe 10 years, but it was as a child. So I don't know right, if right, all right. those count. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I so said, this is like a perfect, a perfect fit. Um, the fact that you know a little bit about jujitsu, because some most times, even now, people I tell people, you know, I train jujitsu, and it's like, well, what's that karate stuff you do? They, every everything is karate to people who don't know. You sure, know, yeah. Like, yeah. So, I, like I said, that was a, a perfect match. So, I really appreciate you taking out the time to you know talk to me and answer these questions. And um, if every time, if you covered everything that you thought was you know um, uh, important to the topic, uh, again, I just say thank you and I appreciate your um, your time. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. Um, I guess the only thing I would say is if anyone has any medical questions, you know, make sure that they go talk to their doctor about it. Uh, if they have any questions about training uh, and their health, to talk to their doctor first before getting into the ring or getting into the octagon. Um, and if they have any neurologic issues, make sure to bring it up with their doctor or a neurologist in their area to make sure that they're, um, they're safe to train and um, and just being safe out there. Okay. All right. Thank you. And for the viewers, uh, if you like this type of content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave any comments. Again, if you have any medical questions, obviously this isn't a medical uh, advice series. So, you know, like you said, go ahead and talk to a doctor. And um, I, appreciate you, I appreciate you for your time again, and thank you for watching. Of course. My pleasure. Have a great one. All right. You too.